Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with Debbie, we are a public relations and advertising agency that specializes in three focus areas. That's lifestyle, life care, and crisis response management. Um, often we work to create award-winning integrated campaigns for our clients. Um, and all of that, obviously, as you know, starts with research and analysis. So um, we have developed a compass, um, what we frame it as compass, a strategic analysis and planning session um, that stands for communications, planning, analysis, um, and strategy equals solutions. So um, that is kind of what we base all of our work on. Um, you are here today um, as part of our lecture <coughs> team. Um, we often invite industry experts to um, do lunch and learns with our staff here at Debbie, so we can constantly be learning about new trends and information in different industries. And so that is why we invite you here today. Um, we wanted to open that up to our friends. So um, I introduce to you John Sillers. Um, he is a results driven marketer with a track record of delivering top line growth for consumer packaged good companies. He has experience in developing impactful support plans that include broadcast and digital, as well as social media. He also has a broad experience within the consumer products development arena. In his most recent position as Vice President of Marketing at Riley Foods, he has launched over 40 items as part of 13 product launches for six brands in four categories. Um, before I allow him to come on stage, I do want to thank Eric Frank and his team at Your Nutrition Deliver for providing us with a delicious and nutritious breakfast that you guys enjoyed this morning. So thank you, Eric, and the team. Um, so without further delay, Mr. John Sellers. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. And John, thanks a lot for inviting me over here to do this presentation. And Eric, thanks a lot for providing the food. Uh, yes, I have a background in new product development. Um, I've launched a bunch of new products. In my last position, I had about 14 new product launches. Some were successful, some not so much. 85% of all new product launches in the grocery category fail within two years. I mean, that's amazing given the amount of money and time commitment that is put into it. Why would a company do this? Well, the reason is, is because if you were able to hit it right and come out with the next big thing, the rewards can be very significant. Let's go through the agenda. I'm going to talk a little bit about myself really quick, and then I'm going to talk about key trends in food and beverage, just really touch upon them. And then finally talk about some of the best practices. There are going to be 11 best practices that I've identified. I actually graduated from Davidson College. I always had an interest in marketing and I actually grew up outside of the New York City area and so I thought advertising would be a great thing to do. Uh, given that I'm more of a left brain type of person, which means I'm analytical and quantitative, I went into media planning and I worked on products, uh, brands like Kraft General Foods, Hershey's, as well as Campbell's. And then, after about three years, for personal reasons, I moved out to Chicago to work at BBDO, where I quickly ended up moving from media planning to account service, working on their biggest account out there, which was the Wrigley account. Uh, we were actually in the Wrigley building, which was pretty cool. I had a view of the Chicago River outside my window. It was great. But anyway, I got to work on the launch of Wrigley's Winter Fresh, which was my first new products experience, and it was a lot of fun. Uh, but that interaction with clients made me want to become a client myself, and so I decided to go back to business school, and I went to NYU Stern School of Business. <coughs> Coming out of business school, I wanted to get that boilerplate consumer packaged goods experience, brand management, and so I worked at Kraft in their cheese division on products like Velveeta and Cheese Whiz and grated Parmesan and natural cheese. Great experience, fantastic. And after about five years, I went over to Bush Brothers to, as, to become a new product development manager. Now, many of you know that my wife is from New Orleans. And shortly after joining Bush's, I received a call about an opportunity at Zatarain's. And so I had to pursue that, ended up taking the job there. In the December of 2004, uh, worked on the launch of a number of frozen items as well as some breading products that were more that you would bread your seafood and put it in the oven. However, when you were done, it tasted like fried seafood, but you didn't have the nasty, unhealthy effects of fried food. Uh, after a couple of years, I went over to my most recent position as uh, Vice President of Marketing at Riley Foods, where I hired and motivated a team of nine people, including two food scientists, built brands, and again, 
launched a bunch of new products. And that's me. Now, let's talk about key trends in food and beverage. When I think about the food and beverage category, okay, and I'm talking about grocery stores, we're not talking about restaurant or food service, we're just talking about groceries, okay? I see it as a very calm body of water. There's not much going on. Why? Because it's not really growing. And that's because the population isn't growing. And so really what you have to rely on are either gusts of wind or underlying currents, okay? So every once in a while you get that gust of wind, possibly a trend, and all of a sudden that calm water allows the, you have the wind and it fills up your sails and you're actually moving along. And it's great to embrace those trends. You know, consumers will be more willing to embrace your product. Customers who are the retailers will be willing to accept the product. However, if you go against these trends, you're going to be like a fish swimming <laughs> upstream. So I'm going to talk about three trends. They are, and before I go into this, there are three trends, and many of you are thinking, only three? I've looked at lists of 10 trends, 15 trends in food. These are how I look at them. Now, there could be others. I'm not here to debate what's a trend and what's not a trend, but we can also see what the importance of these trends are. First of all, there's out with the bad. Second, there's in with the good. And then finally, less cooking at home. So let's talk about out with the bad. What I'm talking about are things that are in your food that are bad for you, okay? And that's evolved over time. You know, thinking about the 80s and the early 90s is when we started to have an obesity problem in this country and people said it was fat. People are getting fat, so it must be the fat in their food. And so consumer packaged goods manufacturers all of a sudden came out with fat-free, low-fat, and light versions of their products. And they replaced the fat in many cases with starches, which, interesting to know, is that starches, when they make them with starches, it costs less than with fat. And so these guys were making more money on their fat-free and low-fat products than they were with their full fat. Now, as we know that, you know, it turned out that some fat is good for you. And this, although fat is still very important, people still are watching the fat, and these light and low low fat products are still on the shelves, that's kind of died down. And so going into the mid to late 90s and the early 2000s, we started hearing about Atkins. And you know, Atkins said, we have to get rid of the carbohydrates out of our diet. You gotta get rid of them. So the packaged good manufacturers responded with carb-free products. You had Carb Well and Carb Clever and Carb Style and Carb Killer and all of those products. And this is what you saw on the shelves in the late 90s and early 2000s. But now we've gotten smarter. And we've identified four horsemen of the apocalypse. These are the four bad things that we need to avoid today. They are sugar, anything artificial, GMOs, and gluten. Those are the four bads. So let's talk about sugar first. You know, I talked a little bit about the when we replace fat with starch, what you don't realize is that's a complex carbohydrate, and carbohydrates are made up of sugar. And so, in fact, what we were doing is when we were trying to address the obesity epidemic, we were actually probably perpetuating it because people were getting more carbs in their body and then more sugar. And then we also know about <coughs> soda which has a huge amount of sugar. We've seen this. I mean, all of a sudden, people are running away from soda. It's bad for you. It's got so much sugar. I think there are between 30 and 40 grams of sugar in a can of Coke. And so the, the consumers have responded in kind. This is soft drinks. And then you see all the other product, particularly bottled water and even wine and distilled, distilled spirits and tea, which are actually growing. So that's the deal with sugar. Nothing artificial. Some people are trying to address the, the sugar craze by going into artificial sweeteners. But look what's happening to artificial sweeteners. We're also, there was actually a news report last week which talked about the fact that artificial sweeteners, you're nodding your head, why is that? I, I read it and I was just, I, it was, everybody I knew mean, was talking about it and we're like going out and throwing away their um, artificial sweeteners. Yeah, artificial sweeteners apparently do something to gut bacteria, 
which inhibit the ability to process sugars which are contributing to obesity, which, ama which is amazing. And you can see what the effect has been over the past five years to artificial sweeteners. And the green, which is growing, is stevia, which is a natural sweetener. It's a natural zero-calorie sweetener. That's the only one that's growing in the category. It's pretty amazing. Who knows what GMO stands for? genetically modified organism. Basically what you're doing is you're taking a product and you're pulling out some genes and replacing them with other genes. It's usually an agricultural product, almost always an agricultural product. Think seedless watermelon, okay? Of course a seedless watermelon doesn't grow in nature actually unless it's being messed with by a human being, okay? But there are other applications products that are resistant to pesticides, so a farmer can throw a lot of uh, pesticides and not worry, resistance to weed killer, so they can throw weed killer, which is going to kill the weeds, but the product isn't going to be affected. Improves yields, all right, is drought resistant. And you can see that some of the key ingredients, corn, soybeans, which are, which means the GMOs are in 80% of all packaged goods today is, that's why, because you're in actually corn and soybeans, all right? GMOs are actually growing by, in the past year alone, GMOs have grown by 28% to a $3 billion category. And you can see that it's become a really big business. You have kettle brand potato chips with a GMO, you have Annie's toaster pastries, non-GMO, and then way better snacks, which also are non-GMO. And so I'm not here to talk about whether GMOs are good for you or bad for you. What I'm here to talk about is if you go non-GMO, that's gonna be a nice puff of wind in your sails. <coughs> what about gluten? Who knows what celiac disease is? It's an autoimmune, autoimmune reaction, causes damage to your intestines. Basically, two to three million people in America today suffer from celiac disease. That's less than 1% of the population, okay? Another 18 million suffer from uh, uh, gluten intolerance. It's not necessarily celiac disease. They frequently feel that it's causing indigestions. A lot of it is self-diagnosed and they feel that gluten is bad for them. Other people are actually think that gluten actually is making them fatter and there's absolutely no science to it. But what you see is gluten is exploding. It's really going up there. And of course, you're starting to see gluten-free products out there. Not only are these new products, but you also have companies like General Mills who has come out with 600 products and labeled them gluten-free. Frequently, the product has been ex in existence for a very long time. They've just said, hey, we don't have gluten. And that becomes motivating for the consumer. And so we've talked about out with the bad. Fat, well, it was actually at one point it was fat, and then it became carbohydrates, but now we know it's sugar, GMOs, gluten, and then what was the last one? There was a, no artificial anything, exactly. <laughs> you would think, so you know, what can I eat? What can I eat? What is, protein is one. Protein is, fills you up, it helps with muscle mass growth, and a lot of people, you know, way back when, people thought that, you know, only the muscle heads ate protein. That's what they had to do. If you were going to be a bodybuilder, you had to eat lots of protein. But protein is actually good for you, especially lean protein. But manufacturers have come out with their own protein products as well. You have Chobani. Everybody knows about Greek yogurt. One of the reasons why Greek yogurt is doing so well is because it has a lot of protein in it. Uh, General Mills under their Natural Valley, Nature Valley brand has come out with protein snacks. And then you've always had your protein drinks, but even Oscar Mayer is coming out with a P3, a portable <coughs> protein pack. That's so great, they're all doing it. And, and they put huge advertising behind the, 
protein match. Yeah. Hit television together, really oh yeah, absolutely. Because I mean, I think that they were watching their launchable business kind of get soft, and they see an opportunity here. And you know, launchables was a huge business for them, or it still is. And this is a way for them to kind of reignite the business. I mean, it's made on the same lines. It's John, just a fast question about that. Obviously, a hot dog has protein in it. So why would Oscar Mayer feel like it has to reinforce that message? Is it because people aren't even aware that hot dogs have protein? Well, I, th protein in it well I think they, yeah, a hot dog has protein in it, but is it, is it, is it the... I could go back a couple pages and I showed that uh, graphic of all the lean protein. I didn't see any frankfurters in there. And so people don't think of a hot dog as probably healthy protein. But you look in here and you have the portable protein pack and so it's it's probably lean protein. Okay. Yes? Just the only other question I would ask just in quickly is I, I, would, I would guess that as a marketer, the problems that everybody faces is the American, are the American public that savvy to know about where protein is, or do we really feel like we have to reach out to them and educate them on that? People don't know where protein is. They have no idea. I mean, these are the same people who think that, and I'm not trying to say that, uh, that America is not intelligent. It's just that we're constantly coming up. I mean, you think about it. We initially said that it's the fat in food which is making us fat, and then it was carbohydrates, and then it was gluten. Gluten doesn't cause obesity. Gluten causes celiac disease for a very small portion of the population, and then there are a number of people who have gluten intolerance, but then there's a number of people who think that I'm eating less gluten because it was making me fat. Gluten isn't doing that. But it's, so there's a lot of information flying around there. This is most Americans are very confused about nutritional. Yes, a lot of Americans are very confused, and it's something that I have to keep in the back of my mind too, because I've lived this stuff for 15 years, and so to go back and think about a consumer who's not thinking about it all the time, you know, that's something that I had to do in my business because, like, when I was working on Velveeta, when I was at Kraft, I was thinking about Velveeta all the time. It's amazing. Or any other product that I worked on, Blue Plate Mayonnaise, thought about mayonnaise all the time. But your consumers aren't thinking about them. Even your loyal consumers are not thinking about your products as frequently as you are. So, and they're thinking about it in a very different way, too. So. Just to add an example of that, those Nature Valley protein yeah. bars are extremely high in sugar. So yes. as Americans, I used to love Nature Valley, and then I took it away as a meat ingredient label. Never had one again. So it's confusing to the average mainstream customer. What am I not? Yeah, and that which just it was, a, and that's why I just thought, oh gosh, you know, you know, and it occurs to me, I guess not even you're talking about it, that you know, somebody who wouldn't know that meat has protein in it, but I guess there's a lot of people who are just totally clueless. Yeah, they just it, they they just don't think about it, um, you know, and there are some products. I remember I saw a line <laughs> of cookies that came out called Who Knew, and these were products that said we have as much calcium as a glass of milk, we have as much fiber as an apple. We have as much vitamin C as a glass of orange juice. Yeah, we also have as much sugar as a can of Coke, but they didn't say that. That product, I think it's still on the shelves, but it didn't really catch fire like it did. The person who came out with that is the same person who came out with Hot Pockets, which was a much more successful launch. Yeah, my former employer. <laughs> John, I know this is, this is a little off-topic, but along the same lines, uh, food in the restaurant category is had this study in this now. Oh, absolutely. Restaurants have to look at how they're doing it. One of the things they're looking at is kind of what Katie pointed out that consumers will look at the front of the package, it says, you know, protein, it says all the good things. Most people don't turn it over to read the ingredients. With packed foods, the regulation has always been to, to provide that. Now, as restaurants are going to need to do with menus, they're trying to see what they can do to mimic this behavior where they can get the consumer to look at just the front of the package and not look at the requirement. Right. I mean, there's even an initiative going on in, in this city 
uh, I can't remember what it was called. I was listening to uh, Poppy Tooker's uh, show on NPR a few weeks ago. Had Molly Kimball, who's a columnist who writes for the Times Picayune, and there's a an initiative where they're going to a lot of the chefs at a lot of the restaurants, saying, "Hey, can you make these adjustments to your to the recipe here, which will make it qualify, and we'll be able to put a nice mark on it on your menu, and then communicate what this initiative is." So if you go into a restaurant, you'll know that. A menu item that has that mark on it is going to be healthy for you. Yeah, actually in food service and in restaurants, yeah, they have to think about it too. Some of it's coming from legislation, state legislation. If you've, if you've been up to New York lately and you've gone into a McDonald's, you see that you have the calories on the menu board. I mean, I remember I used to go into McDonald's and for breakfast, it was always great. I'd have my sausage egg McMuffin and I would have my egg McMuffin. They were so, it was the best breakfast in the world. But I went in there and I just said, huh, 500 calories, sausage egg McMuffin, 700 calories. Holy smokes. And a sausage egg McMuffin? I mean, it's insane. It's insane. But does that really, does there... But does that really move the needle? Or are people really looking? You may be looking at it because you're a smart, educated guy. Well, they're saying you know there are some studies that say well it's not really doing anything to impact, right. and there are others. I think it really comes down to you know further up the income scale, further up the intelligence scale. Not I'm I'm not saying that those two are linked, correlated, <laughs> but those people are are thinking intelligently, cognitively, whereas other people are just saying. Yeah, I'll have what I've always had. I don't really care how many calories are in it. Where they don't even think about it. But then if you go to like um, Chipotle and look at how much calories are in a burrito, and you know, those are probably 700 calories, and people are like, oh yeah, but it's like, on the table, like two ranch chickens are in here. It's not big deal. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it really is. But so, that's what protein is. I mean, so you, you can get protein from meat, fish, uh, chicken, all of those items, nuts, legumes. But, of course, food manufacturers wanting to cap capitalize on those trends because, again, they're sitting on a very calm body of water and they have to take advantage of every current and every puff of wind that comes along. So if protein's big, they're all over it. Another one, fiber. Let's think about it. Fiber is huge now. It's another big thing. And fiber is easily gotten from vegetables, from beans, from fruits, from nuts, and even whole grains. So these are great sources of fiber. However, you have food manufacturers who are entering into the, the fiber category. In fact, our friend General Mills came out with a brand called Fiber One. And they've pushed into other items, different cereals, nutrition bars. And now they've even come out with a product where you can kill two birds with one stone. Eat fiber one with protein. So get your protein and fiber all at once. Interesting, isn't it? <sighs> Finally, local ingredients. Insight being, hey, if I buy a product that has local ingredients, I'm helping the local farmers, therefore I'm helping the local economy. And in fact, if my product is grown in St. Francisville, it's not going to have to travel as far than it was grown in Fresno. Isn't that fantastic? And so how many people go to the Crescent City Farmers Markets? And New Jersey has an initiative where you can put, if you're, if you're a farmer, you can put this on your packaging to sell your product. And they get behind it and start getting behind a Jersey Fresh initiative for all their farmers. Less cooking at home. This is a trend where the pink bars are women and the blue bars are men. Clever, huh? But going back to the 1960s, women, basically every woman used to cook, you know, nine out of 10 women. So there was one woman who knows what she did. But anyway, over time, it's gone to a third of women no longer cook. Why is that? Well, it's probably because they're in the workforce, you know? And you can see that, so 24% change, all right? Yeah, men accommodated for it. Half of them got the message and said, oh yeah, well, I'll cook because my wife is working. The other one are still wondering what my wife is gonna cook for me when she gets home from an eight hour day. 
At the same time, those that do spend time in the kitchen are spending less time going back where they used to spend almost two hours a day in the kitchen. They're going down to an hour a day. And you can see that men, basically, they're spending the same amount of time. Well, that's how long it takes to open up some bread for a sandwich. Exactly. Make popcorn. Exactly. <laughs> And a lot of that, you know, this is probably also being driven by convenience, you know, and so they were looking for convenient alternatives. I mean, what is Hamburger Helper all about? It's about a fast, convenient way to eat dinner. And also, consumer packaged goods manufacturers came out with more convenient alternatives to their <coughs> traditional ingredients. Something very simple as, you know, going from chunk cheese to shredded cheese or a loaf of Velveeta, which is near and dear to my heart, to products which already have Velveeta in them. And so all you have to do is heat and eat. That takes less time. And of course, there's snacking. Snacking is on the rise. Whether you're eating candy, whether you're eating an apple or some other kind of fruit, or maybe Jack Links, which is another beef snacks, protein snacks are exploding, eating an energy bar, potato chips, cookies, it doesn't matter. Snacking has become a meal replacement vehicle. And millennials, basically half of them are eating more than three snacks a day versus a quarter of baby boomers. So it's a behavior as people are becoming less experienced in the, the kitchen, they're starting to use snacking as a way to eat a meal. I mean, how many of you had a Greek yogurt or an energy bar on the way to work today? A lot of you probably did because it's very difficult to eat a bowl of cereal or a plate of bacon and eggs while you're driving to work. <laughs> it just is. And it's become much more convenient. I'm still upset about those McDonald's. <laughs> <laughs> I love those too. I'm so sad. And so as a trends recap, you know, again, we talked about out with the bad, trying to get those bad things out of food, and it's been happening for a long time. In with the good, get that protein, get that fiber, make sure it's locally grown, and all of those things. And then less cooking. As women are entering the workforce, as we become more busy looking at our iPhones and iPads, we don't have time to cook, and so we need convenient alternatives, and we're snacking. And sometimes the most successful products Here's a power bar, you know, energy bars have been growing. Not only are you getting a lot of good, but they're also getting rid of the bad and you can carry it around with you. So this is actually capturing on all three of the trends. And again, there are probably other trends out there, personalization, uh, many flavors. There are a lot of them. These are trends that are really providing momentum for food manufacturers or if you're looking to launch a new product, you should really capitalize on some of these, or at least don't go against the grain because you'll be like that fish swimming upstream. So let's talk about best practices, okay? Let's assume that you've come out with a product that has no sugar, has lots of fiber and protein. The person can carry it around with them. They don't have to cook for a long time with it. Is it gonna succeed? It may, it may not, we don't know. There are a number of things, success is not guaranteed, but there are a number of practices that you can follow that will help you get to that success, okay? First, I'm gonna talk about the four Ps and then I'll talk about two Ps. So six Ps in all. The first four Ps, those of you who have had a marketing class, there is product, Placement, also known as distribution, pricing, and promotion. I'm going to talk about best practices behind each of those. And then how many of you have seen The Profit on CNBC? It's about a guy who comes in. He's, he's a millionaire. He's made a bunch of money in business before, and he comes into a troubled small business, and he says, there are three things I follow, product, and then process, and people. Those are the things I'm going to fix at your company. I'm going to turn it around. His name is Marcus Lemonis. Okay, so those are the five categories that where all of the best practices fall. So let's talk about product, first of all. Consumer testing. Say you have that product that has no sugar, is high in fiber and protein, and it's fantastic. How are you going to assure success? You know, maybe testing. Testing is probably a good idea because one of the things you have to make sure is that the product actually tastes good. 
The fact of the matter is, is that there's a lot of testing you can do. You know, there's concept testing, concept product testing, in-home use testing, price sensitivity testing. There's something called eye tracking studies. It's amazing. What you should do is do what I do. Call a research company, okay? And come to them and say, this is my problem and this is my budget. And when you go to them, here are the things that you're really going to you need, really need to keep on top of and the factors that impact the cost of a consumer test, the number of respondents, the number of questions asked, the length of the questionnaire, the types of response, whether it's a yes, no, or you're asking them for their opinion. It's called open-ended. And then anything adds to logistical complexity. If it's an internet test, that's pretty easy. But if you're doing a mall intercept, well, that's kind of complex. If you're doing a central location test, which is people come here and try the product, that's less expensive than an in-home use test where you're mailing it out to the consumers and then they have to mail it back. So those are just the things you have to keep in the back of your mind on complexity. Shelf life testing. Every food product in the grocery store has a shelf life. Even salt has a shelf life. Okay? How long is salt shelf life? I think it's about four years. Yes. I think it's about four years. And I think the reason why they do that is just so they can move the inventory. I'm not sure about that. So. <laughs> Very important. When you come out with a new product, you should check your shelf life. You really should. And the way you find out what your shelf life is, you take your product and you taste it on a monthly basis. And every time you taste it, you're tasting against something that was just produced. And so you're looking for that time when the flavor starts to degrade to a point where you're just going to think that the consumer thinks there's something wrong with it. It's very important to understand what your shelf life and your objective is to make your shelf life as long as feasibly possible because a lot of retailers will say, if your product doesn't have 50% shelf life, when I receive it, I'm not taking it. What is 50%? 50%. So if I've got a year of shelf life, if it's got less than six months remaining, I'm not going to take it. I'm not going to take it. And so it means that you're going to have to make shorter production runs. <coughs> it makes it very challenging. And I'll tell you, for private label manufacturers, the retailers will say 80%, which I think is just insane. Is that just a ploy to keep private label off the... Uh, no, it's to make sure that the private label product is fresh. Is fresh. Is there a difference on shelf life? I would see milk is perishable. Yes. And special K. Yeah, not special K. I mean, for gosh sakes. I mean, help me out. It's, it's got a one-year shelf life because it may start tasting stale. A lot, a, many, many products have a shelf life of one year. Velveeta, you would think, has a nuclear half-life. It actually only has a, a one-year shelf life. Tea, two years. Coffee, one year. Chili mix, which are the little satchels, that's two years. So that means is if you've got a product, if you've got a packet of chili which has one year remaining or let's say 11 months remaining on shelf, retailers aren't going to take it. Can you imagine that? It's very interesting. And you've got all this distribution cost. It's a challenge. But yet, companies still come out with new products. Because if they make it right, the rewards are unending. Now that we've talked about product best practices, let's talk about distribution best practices. <coughs> Where do they shop, okay? Think about your consumer. You've come out with a new product, okay? You're gonna set, have them go to the grocery store. That's where I'm gonna sell it. Well, the grocery store has kind of changed over time. It used to be you'd either go to Rouse's or Winn-Dixie, and those were the only kind of grocery stores, but now it's morphed into the fresh format, and even dollar stores are selling it, and club stores, and you have super centers. Interesting point is that this is the rate of inflation over the next five years, about 3%, okay? Traditional supermarket is not even going to be keeping up with the rate of inflation talking about a fish swimming upstream. Fresh format, which is like fresh market, whole foods, they're gonna be growing like a weed. E-commerce, Amazon is getting into food big time, okay? Even in fresh format. In Seattle, in Los Angeles, and San Francisco, Amazon is testing a model where if you place your order by 10 o'clock, we'll deliver it to you by six o'clock. Fresh produce, anything. They will bring it all in. 
And that is starting to grow because sooner or later, although e-commerce represents a very small portion of food and beverage retailing, it's going to start growing very quickly. It is growing very quickly and it's going to start getting bigger and bigger and more important. Limited assortment, which is Trader Joe's and Aldi, as well as Save-A-Lot. The dollar stores, you're talking about Dollar General and Family Dollar. So you can imagine somebody who's going to the dollar store for grocery probably never darkens the door of a fresh format. And so you really have to have a good understanding of where your target audience shops before you go. And so, yes? I just wanted to add commerce, and this is outside of the grocery realm a little bit, but I think it will eventually impact grocery stores. Um, concepts like plated, which was recently on Shark Tank, which I'm addicted to, but it's basically... It's so you have seen the profit too, right? Anyway, go ahead. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but it's, it's this, I guess, innovative new service where you order all the ingredients for a So you still have to cook it, but all of the ingredients fresh come to you in a box, in a refrigerated box, including the chicken breasts, the steak, whatever you ordered, the meal you ordered with the little recipe card and how to make it. Yeah, it's in. It's, I don't, <laughs> it's, it's not in New Orleans yet, but even if it was, you would still want to order your nutrition to order. But, um, but it's, uh, yeah, yeah, but I think it's up in the East Coast. I think San Francisco too. Yeah, East Coast, San Francisco, and those, Bigger areas where, like you mentioned, blue states, right? <laughs> well, yeah, and, and and what I'll say is, yes, Amazon's looking into it, but basically every other manufacturing is, uh, retailer is falling over themselves. Walmart is looking at it. Walmart is looking at, and a number of them are looking at the possibility of going. You know, you you place your order online and then you swing by and you pick it up. I mean, think about. Who's been, to, who's been to Rouse's on Chapatulis at 5 p.m. on a weekday? Okay? I mean, it's, it's the worst. I do my shopping on Saturday mornings. Weekday afternoon is the worst. I can't imagine going in there without any idea what to make for dinner. And so you can see a concept where somebody places an order online and Rouse's has taken a section of the store to pick those items for you. You swing by, just grab it, and take off. Last question for you, John. So what does that mean for the Rouse's and the Bromarts and all of these Kroger's and these traditional grocery stores? Because it seems from your chart that all these non-traditional outlets mm -hmm. for consuming food or buying food are, are growing exponentially and the traditional grocery store or supermarket seems to be a loser. Is that correct? Or yes. Yeah. Some of them are going to die. Not all of them are going to die. Well, I mean, if I, if, I, if, I, if I was to place money on the ones that I thought were going to die, Del Hayes, which owns Food Lion, they're going to go away. They're just, they're, they're I'm not going to go into the reasons. When dixie could go away. Rouse's may stay. You know, they have that local corner of the market. Kroger, which is, after Walmart, the second largest food retailer. Uh, they actually do a big push behind private label. They have stores from coast to coast. They just bought Harris Teeter in North Carolina. They yes, they did. Yes, they did. But they're not going to mess with the name. I, I got so many calls of people saying, Oh, Kroger bought Harris Teeter. They're going to ruin Harris Teeter. And what they've said is, No, we're just going to let it run. So they've, they've done that with a number of stores on the West Coast, Fred Meyer, QFC. But... Um, yeah, they are really big, and what they try to do is push private label, because at the end of the day, retailers make more money on private label than they make on the branded products. You go into Kroger to present a new item, and they have a big banner that says, our objective is to grow our private brands at the expense of branded <laughs> products. You're thinking, great, <laughs> wonderful partner. <laughs> Can't wait. That's the business I chose to be in. <sighs> so, so you've made a decision. You said, okay, I'm gonna pick, I've figured out where my shopper goes. And so your, cu your customer, you go in and you talk to a buyer who is going to be in charge of a, of a category, okay? Let's think about, um, let's think, Billy Bosch, who has Be Well Nutrition. He sells an iconic, the product is called Iconic. He's a local guy. You can find his product in Rouse's and Langensteins. It's a healthy beverage drink, okay? So he, you go in there. 
he, Billy goes in and makes a presentation to the customer. The customer is going to ask, what are you going to do to grow my category? How are you going to grow my category? It's, it's the quintessential what's in it for me phrase. How are you going to grow my category? I don't care how wonderful your product. How are you going to grow my category? There are three ways that you can grow his category or that Billy can do it. Billy can bring more users into the category. Okay, you have a healthy beverage. People say, okay, Billy's product tastes better than any other healthy beverage and normally don't buy these things. Like you have muscle milk and some of the other stuff. Those were made for muscle heads. This is something that's actually made for me. I'm gonna start buying this product. He's bringing new users to the category, okay? Get current users to buy more. Somebody who was buying muscle milk once a week is buying Billy's product three times a week because it tastes so good, okay? So that's gonna help. Another possibility is my product tastes so good that people are gonna pay more for my item than they were for the current item, okay? Those are the three ways you do it. You are not going to get in by stealing share. All that does is the re retailer had one shelf slot for $1,000, now he has two shelf slots for to sell a thousand dollars of item that doesn't work for him that's very inefficient so those are the three ways you grow the category yes john i, I didn't understand the stealing share what is stealing share billy comes in and says my product tastes better than muscle milk okay and the guy's going to say okay who cares because if that's not going to bring new users to the category or get my current users to buy more of my category, I really don't care. So if, if currently the retailer is selling $1,000 worth of muscle milk a week, okay, and Billy comes in and he says, Iconic is gonna steal $300 of that $1,000 and he's selling, now muscle milk is selling $700, you still have $1,000. What Billy has to say is, yeah, I might steal $300 from him, but I'm also gonna bring another 500 that you didn't have before because people are gonna be buying more of it. I'm gonna be bringing new users into the category. That's what your buyer wants to hear because his whole objective there is to grow sales. That's all he is. That, that's what he's, he is, he's compensated on the amount of top line revenue and the amount of margin he brings in. So let's talk about pricing best practices. First, you have to factor in the consideration set. Okay, we just talked about Billy and the healthy beverage category, things like muscle milk and some of the other ones. You know, if you have a truly innovative product, maybe it doesn't have a consideration set, all right? They're, they're, it's, it's truly innovative. And so maybe what you're gonna need to do is do some testing, find out what will consumers buy instead of that. A buy of yours, what will they no longer buy? And that will help you out. But for the example that we're talking here, let's talk mayonnaise. Mayonnaise is pretty easy, okay? Here are th four mayonnaise brands that are sitting on your, in your local grocery store. And say you wanna come out with a mayonnaise product, okay? A new brand of mayonnaise, we'll call it Devony mayonnaise, okay? <laughs> he thinks that there's an opportunity there, Devony mayonnaise, and so, John says, all right, I'm going to need to be somewhere between $4.50 and $5 to be right in that because I think I want to be competitive, okay? And so John's product costs are $2.50, okay? But he's not doing this as a charity. You need to factor in the three C's, okay? The first C is the company, all right? There's the company margin, 30%. So you're going to sell that to the retailer for $3.57, okay? So you're making a nice 30% margin, right? So the customer is going to need to make, the customer margins can range anywhere from 20% to 45%, but John thinks that, you know, I'm thinking 25% margin, you know, they're, they're gonna accept that, that's what the category is. And so after the customer margin, the retailer price is $4.76, and so, you're right in there. You're right underneath two of the brands out there, but you're above some of the others. But what of John, what? Oh, Dukes. Dukes, it's actually made in uh, North Carolina. It's a North Carolina brand. But what if John was a little, he was wearing rose colored sunglasses. And the retailer margin is 35%. And so now all of a sudden, 
in absolute, that's a much higher, and he's at 550. He, he's way out of the league. And so if he wants to get below, the retailer is not going to budge off that 35%. He's going to have to take less. He may have to take a 10% margin. So that's something that you really have to factor as you're developing this, the three Cs, the company, the customer, and the consumer. Those are the things you need to pay attention to. Brand fit. Okay, if you come out with a new product, say you already have a brand out there, you need to think about the brand and how far could I extend? We're talking about extendability, okay? I'm going to bring up the General Mills example, okay? They came out years ago with Fiber One, okay? And people loved it. They said, this is a great product. It gets my fiber, fantastic, and it really doesn't have that many calories. And Fiber One said, hey, we've got something good here. And so they came out with a, a, a different line of cereals, something that has you know, flakes and clusters and just they thought it would be a great idea. And then they figured they could break out of the cereal category and they went into kind of granola bars. You know, this is the same company that makes Nature Valley, so they could do that as well. And, you know, it's for breakfast and so I could see the extendability. But then they came out with strudels, which is a little more of a reach to here are two things that are appearing in my Cookies and gummies, okay? Can you believe it? But it's always on my shopping list. I don't, buy, I don't eat it. Somebody else in my house does, I'm not gonna say. Like fiber one cookies, or fiber one cookies, both. Wow, how do they taste? I've never tried them. <laughs> <laughs> but that's an interesting evolution, a very interesting evolution. Now, Let's say if the head of marketing for Fiber One way back when decided to just come out with cookies and gummies. Do you think cookies and gummies would have been as successful? No. You know, you had to kind of walk the consumer there, kind of just, come on, we can extend this a little bit, and that's how it is. So you have to think about brand fit. So don't sell gummy mayonnaise to your own mayonnaise. <laughs> <laughs> don't skip to the mayonnaise. <laughs> now we're going to talk a little bit about math, okay? Promotion best practices. There's TA plus A plus T equals U. TA stands for target audience. We live in New Orleans, okay? About 1.1 million people between St. Tammany, Orleans, Jefferson, St. Bernard, and Plaquemines Parish, okay? Let's say you've developed a product and you think that Roughly half of those people, or 500,000, are in the target audience, okay? You've identified, these are your prospects, 500,000, okay? So you start your advertising, whether it's print, TV, Twitter, Facebook, whatever, and you start shouting from the mountaintops that your product is out there because you need to be heard. And you are able to get basically three out of five aware of your product, okay? And so... That means for every five people who are in your target audience, you're going to get three of them aware, okay? And let's say half of them decide to go try the product, okay? So now you have triers. Now you're going to have some people who say, I love this, and others who say, I don't love it. Your users are 100,000. So basically, we have these conversion factors right here. Okay, and so if you're happy with those 100,000 triers, great. But if you want to, or users, great. If you need 200,000 users to make your volumes, you're going to have to work on these conversion factors. Maybe you need to improve the product. Maybe you need to do a, a trial building initiative. If it's Billy Bosch, he needs to do some sampling. Or if it's Devany Mayonnaise, he needs to send a coupon out. Or you need to do more advertising and get those awares up higher so it goes into your funnel. All of those conversion factors. That's how you need to think about this new product. Now that we've talked about the four Ps, we're going to talk about process. StageGate is a process that is fairly well known. But it is a process for not only new product innovation, but it's also for any kind of product management. As you can imagine, developing a new product, there are a lot of moving parts. You have to do the formulation. You have to do the shelf life testing. You have to do the consumer testing. You have to do the packaging. You have to pull your marketing support through. There's this whole thing in terms of pricing and selling and all this 
There are all these steps. And what this allows you to do is take a very literal step, have a process step. And even if you're not working for a big company, if you're an entrepreneur, these are very good steps to go by to if you have to go to investors for more funding, another round of funding. You can say, okay, this is what my business case is. And the neat thing about this process that if you've got a fairly easy product, maybe, you know, in the case when I was working on T, we came out with a line extension of T, which was going to be on the same line. It was just maybe a different version of T. We could forego some of those steps. And so you can plug and play. And so that's what you do on your process to make sure all of these things are happening. That's your process. Really, it's up to the project manager or the project lead, okay? That's the leader who has to do all of these things themselves, okay? But are they going to be doing it all themselves? With a company, he's going to be surrounded by a team, people of different functions. If he's an entrepreneur, he or she is probably going to be working with other people. And these are probably the functions that they're going to be relying on. You'll have a food scientist. You'll have somebody, maybe a co-packer, a co-manufacturer for operations. Somebody who's going to get a, be getting the product from the factory to the retailer. You'll have somebody who's selling. There's advertising, public relations, and then somebody who's counting the money that's coming in. Okay. Frequently, this project leader may be wearing different hats, but in other cases, they're going to have to be relying on people. You have to imagine there's a lot of diversity of experience here, right? And also, you know, just. Just demographic diversity is very helpful, too, on a project team. It's very smart to meet on a regular basis for these things, given that there are so many, new, so many moving parts. But you have to imagine that a food scientist takes a certain kind of person that's probably not much like a, person, a salesman, right? Or, you know, a finance accounting person and an advertising public relation is different. They're all different backgrounds, and they all have to sit in a room and come up, which comes to people, okay? You need to practice civility in these meetings when you're working with these people. There's a book called Choosing Civility by P.M. Forney, and there are nine steps to choosing civility. First of all, pay attention. Be aware and attend to the world or in people around you. Listen, focus on others to better understand their points of view. Be inclusive. Welcome all groups of citizens working for the greater good of the community. That kind of sounds very fairy, but you have to realize that you all are pulling on the same rope, despite the fact your backgrounds are different and may have different points of view. Don't gossip. If you're not getting along, you know, don't backbite. And if somebody on the team is backbiting, don't listen to it. Don't accept it. Show respect. Honor other people. Respect their point of view. Understand it. And be agreeable. Look for opportunities where you can say, yeah, I can see your point in a number of ways I can see you're right. Apologize. When things do get sideways, make sure to loop back and apologize for anything that you did. And don't shift responsibilities. Don't blame. Take responsibility for your actions. And finally, give constructive criticism at the end. The stage gate process has a lessons learned step. We go back and it's kind of a, the, the post launch audit. So, you know, what did we learn? What went well? What didn't go well? That's kind of the constructive criticism. Uh, it allows you to maybe fix steps in the process which didn't go so well. So, the next time you launch a product, it goes better. So, those are the 11 best practices. There's under product consumer testing shelf life. Placement, know where your consumer shops and the sell-in. In pricing, there's the three C's in consideration of the margin and the consideration set. Promotion as brand fit, as well as A plus T, actually TA plus A plus T equals U. Stage gate, and diversity is key, diversity of experience, and then practicing civility throughout the whole process. That concludes my presentation. If you all have any questions. Yes, sir. I have a question. And the analogy you used was the gust of wind or the trend. Yes. And a lot of what we talked about had to do with health, um, consumers being health conscious, either making purchasing decisions based on health or attempting to. Right. 
is that is that a trend that's going to fade and go away? Is it a pendulum that's going to swing in or is it going to become static and be built on? Is there going to be a point where people will disregard that because suddenly there's no, that's a good question. I mean, I think about it in terms of, you know, back in the 80s and early 90s, we thought fat was the bogeyman. And so we, we tried to get fat out of all of our food. And then 10 years later, we said, we're smarter. It's carbs. We got to get carbs out. Fat, yeah, carbs are the bogeyman. We got to get carbs. And now we think that sugar and uh, you know, artificial and GMOs and gluten are the bogeyman. GMOs, I never even knew what a GMO was five years ago. And now all of a sudden it's something that's important. And whether or not you agree to it, whether you think that it's baloney or it's actually, there's some science behind it, it's a trend and there's consumer demand behind it. I think health is always going to be something, it's just going to, it's going to evolve there's going to be something I think what's really interesting, and you're starting to see it in the yogurt, it's a trend that I didn't touch upon, is probiotic. There's this whole gut bacteria. Um, I was reading an article in a magazine about a year ago that talked about the bionome, which is the amount of organisms which are growing inside our bodies. There are more organisms growing inside our bodies than we have cells, which is amazing. It's absolutely incredible. There's a lot more that's going to come behind that, and people are going to say, yeah, I should be eating this and not this. Anyway, last week it turned out that artificial sweeteners may promote obesity because they affect the gut bacteria, which helps to process sugars. Uh, I have a question about you know, uh, <clears throat> packaged food and this whole trend towards buying fresh food only, avoiding packaged food altogether. Is that going to have an impact in the, in the package? market or in, um, are you seeing that or is that just so, uh, a trend that only a small percentage of consumers are doing? Well, I think what's happening is, is you're getting consumers such as, you know, they're going to the Crescent City Farmers Market in the morning to buy their vegetables. They just, they're, they're people who think that, you know, if it's locally grown, it's, you know, I'm not shipping it across the country. I think that's that's going to be good. There's, there, there's just a group of people, you know, it, it doesn't, it, all of these trends don't necessarily have to be followed by everybody for it to become a trend. Right. You know, think, think about gluten. Gluten, I'm, I heard gluten intolerance in 2003 and I disregarded it. I figured, well, not many people have celiac disease, but look at, look at what's happening now. Companies are falling over themselves to say gluten-free on a product that's never had gluten to begin with. It's funny, I teach 100 freshmen, so I use them all the time as a fast focus group. So this year when we did our annual, we did our annual uh, school mass comp kickoff, but we always order pizza, at least four or five requests for gluten-free pizza from the freshmen. To get in, I think you're spot on. And last year- um, You should ask them, why don't you want to eat gluten? They, don't. they say, well, because I don't want to get fat. Right. <laughs> okay. Silly. Okay. Yes. In, uh, in your career, have you ever had to work on a product that you could s clearly see was going against the trends, and how did you handle that? <sighs> Let's think about that. Yeah, I, I have. I have. Um, sometimes what's happening is you are, it's going against one trend, but it's in line with another trend. Um, let, let, let's think about Let's think about snacking, okay? There are basically three reasons to snack. First of all, I'm hungry, okay? I, I need something. Um, another thing is it's a nutrient delivery system, which is, I, I, that's probably the, uh, the, the P3 protein pack. You know, I need more protein, so I'm gonna eat this. And then also there's this indulgence thing. It's, it's, it's chocolate, really good chocolate, or a really good dessert. You think about uh, who's been to Sucre. I mean, that's really got the, it's, it's not Baskin Robbins. Did I just hit a nerve? <laughs> no. <laughs> it sounds good to all of us right now. <laughs> okay, but, you know, it's, it's a step above Baskin Robbins, okay? So if, if I'm going to have an indulgence, it's going to be good. You know, I'm not just going to, 
shovel ice cream in my mouth all the time. I'm going to have an indulgence every once in a while. It's, it's, it's kind of like my, my, you know, it's my permission to be bad. I, I, I started uh, following something called the Ducan diet a couple of years ago. And it, it's, it's pretty rigorous, but he talks about there are two meals during the week where you can be bad. It's called a celebration diet and just, you know, go crazy. Don't like go ridiculous, don't binge, but because he realizes that we are human and, you know, we're going to slip every once in a while. So what you have to do is you have to factor that in. And so did that answer your question or did it not? Sure. Yes. <laughs> it's, it's really, you know, sugar is bad for you, but if you can say, okay, this is an indulgence, maybe I'm going to, yes. Yes. Look like they might take a bit of time. I was wondering how long did it take before you can completely fully launch a product? That's a really good question. Um, one of the things I didn't get into was timeline development. Um, I took a course called Project Management Breakthroughs, which uh, it starts with you have a long piece of laminate paper and it's got bars on it, okay? And each line is a week and each space is a week. And you start from the very end of the project and you say project launch. What had to, what had to happen right before the project launch? <coughs> well, you had to ship the product to the retailer. Okay. What had to happen before that? You had to ship it to your warehouses. What had to happen to that? You had to make it. Okay, what happened to make it? And then all of a sudden you get this split. Well, I had to develop my formulation. I had to do my packaging. I had to have the marketing support. And you back up. It really depends on how long each step takes. You can go out a year and a half on a new product launch. Or you can really be crazy and do it on a much shorter lead time. You know, it's going to require leaning on suppliers. Suppliers will say, well, it takes six weeks. Well, does it really take six weeks? What if I pay you a little bit more money? Can you get it to me in three? But, you know, it's the same thing as um, driving to the airport at night when it's raining, okay? If you're late for the flight, you're going to be driving 80 miles an hour, okay? It's raining and it's dark out, okay? Should you really be driving 80 miles an hour? Because you may end up sliding off the highway and going into a wall. You can, you know... There's an old saying which says, fast, cheap, or good. Pick any two. Okay? Well, I want it fast. Okay, then it's going to cost. Well, I don't have any money. Well, guess what? It's not going to be really good. Consumers are going to try it, and your conversion rate is not going to be 3 to 2. It might be 10 to 1. So, yes, maybe. Not to turn this into any kind of political conversation, uh, but with the changes in the way that my family buys food and makes decisions about food, it's been kind of eye-opening. We order weekly from the Hollywood market through Good Eggs. Uh -huh. So a bag of vegetables with dirt on them. And right. some stuff shows up at my door on Wednesdays every night. I love it. It must be the opposite of the plated because I have no clue what to do with it. <laughs> but I might get an email that says, be careful about the corn because this week we have corn borders. So I've got to go pick the caterpillar out of the corn that was just delivered to my house. And I'm thinking the government might want to say something about that at some point. Uh, you know, the images I have from my childhood of it. Well, no, that's really interesting. It's really and interesting. So, you know, I know that there's all this change to how we make decisions and, you know, farm to table, but it right. seems like, well, okay, am I more comfortable eating the corn water uh, than the giant purple stamp on the roast my mother cooked in 1968? Well, it's oh. interesting. I mean, you may have states which handle that differently. I don't know what goes on in California. They're pretty progressive. Um, you know, they have that Jersey Fresh. I don't know what is required to, to get that Jersey Fresh stamp of approval. Of course, you have to be a farmer in New Jersey, but, you know, what are some of the other steps that you have to, you have to make sure that, you know, the product doesn't have any bacteria, does it need to be washed a certain way? There are certain, there may be certain regulations. Um, as, a, as a consumer packaged goods manufacturer, it's interesting because the, uh, w w what happened was the large retailers 
got ahead of it. You know, we're talking about Walmart, we're talking about Tesco, which is a large retailer in Great Britain, and Carrefour, which is a large retailer in France. They put their heads together and they said, look, you know, we have to develop a, a we have to make sure that the products that we sell are, are, are going to be safe. You know, we don't want consumers dying when they eat it. It kind of happened after that issue with the, uh, the spinach I guess they found that there were, you know, a cow had gotten loose in a spinach field and there and somebody got really sick and died from the spinach. There were a number of deaths, okay? And and that's a nightmare for a retailer, okay? You don't want it for a consumer packaged goods manufacturer as well. And so what they did was that they developed a an initiative called SQF, Safe Quality Foods. And what that means is that there are two independent organizations. One is called British Retail Consortium, and another one is, I can't remember the name of it, but British Retailer. And so what they do is they do an audit of food production facilities. What Walmart did was they said, okay, every private label manufacturer has to, all my private label manufacturers have to have a BRC audit, British Retail Consortium audit, by this date, or we're not going to take any more of your product. And so they came in and went through this process, and it's not just one, one time, it's every year. And the audits get more and more stringent because they discover new things, and it can cost a lot of money, but that's just, that's the way that a Walmart, a Tesco, and a Carrefour, and anybody else kind of gets at the head of it. They're not going to rely on the government, because at the end of the day, the government might be behind it. it it's, it's, it's interesting to see how the government has embraced it, like the whole natural foods um, there's been a lot of new litigation about what's natural, what's not natural. They go to the FDA, and the FDA just says, we're not, we're not making the call. We're not making the call. For whatever reason, maybe it's because of different lobbying groups telling them not to do it or not sure. But that's how it works. Yes? You mentioned on the shelf, the way they determine the shelf life is they taste it monthly. So does that mean if a product has a two-year shelf life, it has to be tested for two years before they put it out to market to know that? Yeah. It's a challenge. It's a real challenge, particularly when you're under a tight timeline and you've got a product that you say, yeah, I think it's got a year, year shelf life. Well, you know, it's a, you know, the first time we made it was four months ago. Yeah, but I think, you know, I've talked to my suppliers and they said it works. Okay, so you start shipping and what about two months later the product starts falling out? Now you've got to pull all this product back. It's a big nightmare. You know, consumers try it and it's not good. Yes? Is there a limit to how long you can put it on board? This is kind of embarrassing, but I bought Captain Crunch at Walmart a month ago and realized on Sunday that it expired and that it was going to be like a month or two. And I didn't need it for three weeks. I have no idea. So it would be fine. But um, I was just wondering if they had to put it for like two years or something because it's a little kids. Yeah, it, it's it's generally what it's it, it's it's sell by. It's best sell by. It's not best eaten by. And so I think what they assume is there's a certain amount of time that's going to sit on your your in your pantry as well. So. And this is that he's a captain. <laughs> <laughs> what it also may be is it, it, what the what the manufacturer for a cereal company may be doing is just saying okay. Everything has this shelf life. It's it's everything a year. Maybe Captain Crunch can last for two years. I don't know. Oh yeah. Are you eating the Captain Crunch? Mm. <laughs> um, so it seems to me this corn to table and natural and like what I've become concerned about lately is all the preservatives. Like, I used to go for granola bar and the vending machine for a snack because I thought it was a healthy option. But now I realize it has all the sugar, and besides the sugar, all the preservatives. Yeah. So, if you're a consumer packaged product manufacturer, the shelf life declines or shortens if you don't have preservatives. Right. Um, it absolutely does. I mean, <clears throat> Also, the manufacturing process itself, um, I would qualify preservatives under the whole nothing artificial. Uh, 
Let's think about ready to drink iced tea. Okay, there are two, there are a number of ways that you can, you can make a beverage, okay? You can do a hot fill, which it's put in at about 180 degrees, and so there's no living form, as long as it's packaged correctly, that's gonna live in there, okay? You don't need a preservative, okay? There's also cold fill, which doesn't cost as much. And you need a preservative for that, okay? So a sodium benzoate is one of them. Uh, there's, there's one other, there are a number of them, but sodium benzoate is one. Uh, your less expensive ready to drink iced teas are cold filled, and so they will have the preservative in them. And so it really has to do with either the manufacturing process or, you know, there are some people who are like yourself are gonna say, I'm not gonna drink something that has a preservative in it. So you're gonna buy a hot fill iced tea. There are some people who actually can taste the preservative. It's got a, a metallic, almost like you put an old penny in your mouth, that copper taste. Any other questions? Richard. Well, thank you very much. Thanks a lot. All right. I have business cards here that have my contact information. Feel free to grab one. And again, what I did want to say on that stage gate, that's a very top line perspective of it. If you'd like more of a, a, a deeper insight into that, you know, leave your card and I'm happy to share it with you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay.